I'm happy to be presenting to you today uh, a presentation entitled A Path Out of the Pandemic, Adapting to a Post-Pandemic Workplace. As we um, begin, you should see my uh, presentation here on the screen. Um, Got to start with a, a disclaimer as we do at the beginning of uh, uh, all presentations like this. And that is that uh, the materials uh, presented in this webinar are for informational purposes only and not for the purpose of providing legal advice. Uh, you should contact your attorney to obtain advice with respect to any particular issue or problem. Uh, participation in this webinar does not create an attorney-client relationship between participant and Shaw Rosenthal. Uh, the opinions expressed in this webinar are not the opinions uh, are the opinions of the individual presenters and may not reflect the opinions of the BBB of Greater Maryland or of our law firm. So um, as we move on into the presentation, um, just a little overview of some of the things that we're going to discuss here today. Um, I know we're all sort of getting uh, our, our, our legs under us, our sea legs under us, and um, getting back into um, a adjustment to the workplace now that the uh, pandemic is um, starting to wane, thankfully. Um, we are um, at a point where we wanna look and see over the past two years, what has really happened um, that has really transformed our, our world and our workplace uh, so that we can sort of adjust to some changing trends uh, that we've seen uh, in, uh, in, in employment area <clears throat> with regards to um, uh, worker trends, uh, worker departures, and the things that people are looking for uh, in a workplace uh, when they do come back to work. So basically, we're going to go over uh, for, four four main topics um, that the slides will fall into. One, current uh, state of the vaccine mandates, uh, testing and masking requirements. Um, second, we'll be talking about uh, rehiring employees, both during and after the pandemic, um, successfully managing remote workers, since remote work has been a big part of what people have been doing over the past two years, and that's likely to continue very much into the future, depending on the type of uh, small business that you have. And then we'll talk about, uh, finally, some practical tips for protecting your company when employees do leave. So next slide, please. Right, next slide. Okay, um, the first topic um, we'll talk about involves, first of all, what is required of every employer by uh, OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Now, under the Occupational um, the Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, there's a general duty clause. And basically what that means is that all employers are required to provide a safe and healthy workplace environment, uh, which includes taking appropriate steps to prevent and address COVID-19 in the workplace. Uh, employers are in, required to furnish a place of employment free from recognized hazards that may cause death or serious physical harm. Uh, over the past two years, in, in addition to uh, monitoring um, regular workplace hazards, um, things that cause employees to slip and fall or get injured at work. OSHA has been keeping an eye on the COVID-19 pandemic and they have weighed in on things that employers need to do to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in the workplace. So along with the CDC guidelines, OSHA has specifically focused on the workplace and things that employers should do uh, in order to maintain a safe workplace that uh, minimizes the potential for the spread of COVID-19. So OSHA strongly encourages the, the vaccination of workers against continuing dangers uh, posed by COVID-19 in the workplace. OSHA does not mandate that you have a mandatory vaccination policy. Uh, what OSHA does is OSHA basically says, hey, 
you need to take whatever steps are reasonable to uh, prevent the spread of COVID. So that would include following CDC guidelines um, that would um, uh, that would guide what an employer does with respect to the workplace. So you know whether it's vaccines, whether it's masking when it's recommended to do so, um, and, and sort of monitoring and keeping people home when um, and when they feel sick. Having policies that encourage those types of things are, are what OSHA would want to see if they ever did an inspection. Now. Um, you should also know that there was a, a mandate that OSHA had uh, proposed or, or was uh, about to implement uh, with respect to um, uh, a vaccination or testing uh, emergency temporary standard. That would have applied had it gone through to employers with 100 or more employees. So not necessarily uh, people involved in, in, in this particular webinar, but you should know that the Supreme Court did ultimately strike down that, um, that mandate by OSHA as being overreaching, basically. What the Supreme Court said is um, permitting OSHA to regulate the hazards of daily life simply because most Americans have jobs and face those same risks while on the clock would significantly expand OSHA's regulatory authority without clear congressional authorization. So what does that mean? Well, basically what it means is that OSHA, you're overstepping your boundaries when you're basically saying everybody has to be uh, vaccinated uh, or, or test. And you know the employers have to provide proof that they've either vaccinated all their employees or tested them all. You're, you're basically intruding a little bit too much into the daily lives of people. So basically, um, the, the Supreme Court, while they did strike down OSHA's ability to make that a, a standard, uh, an emergency standard, uh, nonetheless, the Supreme Court did not uh, pro prohibit OSHA from, um, uh, or, or pro prohibit employers or anyone from having mandatory vaccination policies in their workplace if that's what they want to have. Uh, it's up to the individual employer to make those decisions. It's saying basically OSHA can't make that decision for everybody. Um, so that's where we are with with uh, uh, with with respect to OSHA. Uh, they can still obviously regulate the workplace because that is the um, that is the job and that is the mandate of OSHA. Uh, they just couldn't impose that particular standard. So. Um, Going back, looking at the slides here, the next slide uh, should be vaccine policies. Um, okay. So employers are still allowed to mandate vaccines so long as they provide exemptions uh, for disability uh, and religion. Uh, and that's required under Title VII and also state uh, anti-discrimination laws as well. Um, the um, employer, uh, so basically the CDC recommends that people stay up to date with their va vaccination. So if you go to the CDC website, um, you will see that uh, the CDC uh, has basically tempered their, their guidance basically saying that um, they do recommend and that people get vaccin vaccinated. Um, and uh, we'll see some more things that CDC has said uh, more recently with regards to masking in the workplace as well. So uh, next slide on COVID testing policies. And for some reason, Angie, I don't see the slides on my screen right now, but let me just make sure that everybody else can see them. I think Angie got kicked off the meeting. Oh, she did. Oh. Hmm. Let me see. Yeah, somebody says they're not able to see the slides. Okay. Um, why don't I do this? Uh, I'm going to see if I can get the slides back up on my screen if, if uh, uh, Angie is not um able to get back on so hold on one second let me see if i can do this it looks like she's coming on now oh she's coming on now okay let's 
Angie, are you there? All right. Well, while Angie's getting that up, we'll we'll continue on since you know we have about another forty five minutes here, um, uh, and, and the slides will come back up and, and they'll they'll supplement basically what I'm saying. Um, but basically, with respect to COVID testing policies, employers may still choose to test employees for COVID nineteen. Um, and there are going to be various considerations you want to consider with respect to testing if you're going to have a testing policy. Um, one is determining who to test. Uh, employers can decide whether they want to test um, all employees for COVID or limit testing to employees who are not fully vaccinated. Um, I recently, uh, I have an event that I'm going to be going to um, that requires that the people coming to the event either be vaccinated or tested, and you've got to um, basically submit something showing that you have been vaccinated um, or, or, or tested. So that is something that can be done if that's what you wish to do. Um, if, you, if you have a policy that requires that there be some testing, um, you have to determine um, various things. One is who to test. Should you do it all employees or only unvaccinated employees? Probably to save yourself from any potential discrimination claims by those who are unvaccinated, who feel like they might be um, disparately impacted by this, probably best to test all employees because, um, you know, that way you don't expose yourself to any type of discrimination claim based on that. Um, you can determine how to test. If you, uh, if you have a testing policy, are you going to accept employees who test at home or are you gonna require them to go and be tested somewhere and how frequently? Um, so there's gonna be some varied um, availability of testing in different areas, depending on where you are in the state of Maryland. Um, of course, you can get tests uh, at home uh, the government has, uh, has set up a website for where you can get uh, a free COVID test sent to your home. I think that um, uh, I heard yesterday there have been like, uh, you can get a total of up to 16 tests uh, sent uh, free of charge from the federal government. Um, that is if you allow testing at home. Uh, an interesting thing also about testing, is you have to monitor for wage and hour compliance. Um, and this is something that I think a lot of people may not think about with, um, uh, with respect to uh, COVID testing, because if you require an employee to be tested, the question is, is that going to be considered working time? Um, under the Fair Labor Standards Act, employers must pay for all hours worked. So if if somebody does something outside of their normal working hours, the employer must pay for any time spent on activities that are required in order for the employee to safely and effectively perform their job. Because those activities are considered uh, integral and indispensable to their work. Yeah, Angie's back. So basically any testing or vaccination that occurs during regular working hours must of course be paid. Um, and this is the guidance that has been uh, uh, given um, uh, from the DOL, uh, the Department of Labor. So uh, if, the, if the employer requires vaccination, any off-duty time spent getting the vaccine must also be paid. Um, now, if the employee is required to undergo testing in connection with a legally uh, required medical or religious exemption, uh, to a mandatory vaccination requirement, any off-duty time spent testing must also be paid. Um, so Angie, we're, we're basically on slide number six now. So it's, it, this is Sam uh, with BBB. Angie's having an internet issues, so I will, uh, I'm stepping in for now. Okay, thanks. Sam. Okay, you're welcome. Okay. 
Um, so uh, we're, we're talking about wage and hour requirements with respect to testing. Um, if an employee is, is required to undergo testing because they choose not to be vaccinated, the employer is not then required to pay for any off-duty testing time. Um, so this applies where, where an employer has implemented uh, what we call a, a policy that does not necessarily mandate a vaccination, but requires unvaccinated employees to undergo testing. So that's what we call a vax or test, or, or test policy. So under those circumstances, if somebody chooses not to be vaccinated, um, you don't have to pay for their off-duty test uh, uh, testing time um, if you have a VAX or test policy. Now, if vaccination or testing is not required by the employer, but is encouraged, which is basically where I think most businesses are right now. You're not requiring it, you're just encouraging it. It's the employee's choice. Uh, the employee's choice to engage in uh, activities during off-duty time would not be compensable. So if you're not mandating either, you're just strongly encouraging it, then you're not going to be required to pay an employee for the time that they spend um, uh, testing. So you want to also make sure that you develop procedures. Next slide, please, Sam. Uh, develop procedures for handling positive tests. Um, four and five go together, that and also keeping employee medical information private. Um, you know, you wanna make sure that the, uh, um, any positive test report result is handled confidentially, that you don't share the names of employees who tested positive, um, that you protect uh, employees' medical information and, and confidentiality, just let, as you would any other type of medical information. Uh, you have to be careful not to, um, you know, not to allow those things to become public. Um, don't keep medical records in personnel files. Um, keep them in a separate file and, and ensure compliance with um, ap applicable uh, privacy and data security laws. So basically, you just want to make sure that you um, handle these things confidentially, discreetly, and um, that you don't expose anyone's uh, positive tests. Um, and of course, uh, finally, you have to make sure to provide reasonable accommodations um, where necessary, um, whether it be uh, for religious or disability reasons. Um, you want to make sure that you uh, consider each request on an individual basis and determine whether or not somebody might need help or, you know, might not be able to get to a test site for some reason and um, you know, what you would do under those circumstances. You always have to make an individualized inquiry to see whether there is a reasonable accommodation that a person can receive. Um, that's called the interactive process that's required by the Americans with Disabilities Act. So you wanna make sure that you do that. Same thing with religion, uh, although religion is not as stringent in terms of what you have to do in, in order to um, uh, make an exception or an accommodation. Um, you, you, you do still have to consider uh, whether an accommodation would be necessary. Uh, next slide. Okay. With respect to masking, the CDC has revised its prior guidance um, and now states that masking is no longer required in public indoor areas, which include workplaces or in low or medium risk counties, but is still recommended in high risk counties. So, um, you know, currently in Maryland, uh, I'm not aware of any places that um, require um, testing, I mean, require masking uh, indoors. Um, I still, uh, I believe it's still required in public transportation uh, and in schools, but other than that, um, it's not necessarily required. Uh, the CDC recommends allowing individuals to choose whether they wish to wear masks in the workplace. Um, people who have COVID symptoms um, or have received a positive test or have been exposed to someone with COVID-19 should, should wear a mask. Uh, masks are still recommended in indoor public transportation settings. As I said, next slide. So on the CDC website, regardless of your vaccination status, there's a tool um, uh, for determining 
when and how long to quarantine if you have been exposed uh, to COVID-19 uh, or tested positive for COVID-19. So they've uh, defined close contact um, uh, with respect to somebody else who has COVID-19 uh, as being less than six feet away from someone with COVID-19 for 15 minutes or more over a 24 hour period, regardless of, of masking. So that's what you consider to be close contact and people who should um, take some effort to quarantine uh, after such exposure. So um, again, the, the CDC uh, website, you can basically put in like when you were exposed um, and sort of calculate the number of days that they recommend that you quarantine um, based on that exposure. Next slide. Okay, so basically, as we've come through and, and start to come out of the pandemic, um, there are um, going to be things that, you know, that employers will have to evaluate in terms of your workplace. Have you, did you have to lay off workers during the pan pandemic, which a lot of uh, retail uh, employers did, restaurants um, and, uh, uh, businesses of that nature um, in that industry, uh, which were very hard hit by the COVID pandemic, now that we start to come out of it, um, have been rehiring people into their workplaces. So if you're in the position where you've gotten to a point where business has picked up and now you wanna um, bring people back into the workplace, you know, what's it, what's it like? What's the landscape like out there? What, do, what are the things that you're gonna need to consider? Um, one of the things that has come up in some local legislation has to do with when you rehire people for uh, positions that were formerly occupied and now you're bringing people back, um, do you have to offer employment to people who are laid off or terminated first before you offer it to other people who were not um, previously part of your, your workplace? Um, if there is a union in your workplace, if you have a unionized workplace, you have to consider the collective bargaining agreement, uh, which may contain recall rights for employees who were formerly laid off. So you want to consider that um, first, if, you, if, if indeed you're a unionized workplace. I imagine the vast majority of people, if not everybody on this call, was, is not a, um, uh, a unionized workplace. Uh, so we would... Um, uh, then look and see if there's any type of uh, law or regulation that would uh, affect who you hire um, with respect to hiring people back after the pandemic. Now in Howard County, this is the only county that we're aware of that currently um, has any type of law uh, that affects any type of business um, that's rehiring employees. So in Howard County, if you're located there, um, you should know that uh, as of February 9th, 2022, there was a, a law that requires com commercial property owners, event center um, uh, employers and hotel employers to offer a laid off employee, any position that's available or becomes available for which the laid off employees qualify. So that laid off employee must be given at least five business days to accept or decline the offer and um, they can't be retaliated against for um, you know, requesting their job back or, or, or um, under this particular um, ordinance. So this is an emergency law that's in effect until the end of this year. So again, just in Howard County, um, uh, that is basically the, the law until the end of the year. Uh, with respect to rehiring people who were who were previously laid off. Okay, next um, next slide. Okay, so as we get into the um, the workplace and what the workplace is like after a COVID, um, depending on the nature of your business, um, there may or may not be more requests that you have to deal with. Uh, for remote work. Obviously, for some types of things, um, you know, a customer facing position 
uh, hotels, restaurants, and, and thing and employers of that nature, remote work really just wasn't possible. Um, but with respect to most businesses, uh, remote work is something that is, uh, you know, was done uh, during the pandemic and will continue for some time in the future. Um, what we see is a trend where, where basically things have changed. There's, a, there's really more of an expectation on the part of employees that they will be permitted to work um, at home for at least um, in, in a hybrid model uh, so that they wouldn't be, have to commute every day. I think um, given where we are um, in, uh, in, in our society right now with the, uh, uh, the inflation, um, gas prices and things uh, of, of that nature that impact everyone, um, employees are looking for ways that they can cut costs, not have to commute as much, um, they would be more attracted to jobs that would allow them some sort of hybrid type um, of environment where they would be able to work remotely for at least part of the time. So how would you manage this in your workplace? I mean, you, we, we had to do it to some extent, uh, you know, everybody had to do it to some extent during the pandemic, but how are we gonna do this going forward? So next slide. One of the things that we've recommended in the past, and I think it's still applicable now, is uh, having telecommuting agreements. Uh, that's something that allows you and an employee to agree on certain parameters for um, telecommuting and the environment that, and the expectations that you have for them as remote workers. Um, you wanna make sure that people understand what's expected to them, of them, uh, and are, are able to comply. So uh, a telecommuting uh, agreement is just basically something that says, you know, here are the hours you're going to be available. Um, here are the expectations in terms of meetings, uh, in terms of meeting deadlines, uh, in, in terms of your work product, all those types of things that you want to make sure is, are clear to an employee, just as you would make clear to them if they were in the workplace, you want to have um, guidelines for what they need to be doing while they're at home. So next slide. Okay. Uh, work schedules. You want to make sure that everybody understands what their work hours will be, um, that the supervisor is aware of when um, you're going to be available, um, and, you know, making sure that you make yourself available and adhere to a schedule without distractions. Um, you know, it's important to know that when you want to call an employee, if you need to have uh, a conference call, if you need them to participate in a webinar or something like that, they're not going to have distractions in the background. They're not going to have other things going on that are, um, uh, that are going to impact their ability to, um, you know, to do quality work uh, during the day fine to work at home, but you have to make sure that you're all in, that you are engaged in what is being, um, uh, what's being done and, and what needs to be done for the work um, place while you're at home. So you want to communicate what the schedule is, um, and make sure that everybody understands what they need to do and uh, when they need to be available so that there aren't going to be any um, uh, any surprises when you, you know, call an employee and you find out that they're, you know, they're doing something else uh, when they're supposed to be available to work. Next slide. Uh, work standards. So you want to make sure that you set your expectations clear um, and make the employee understand that, you know, the, you're expecting the same type of productivity uh, and the same type of effort when they're working from home as you would if they were in the in the office. So you want to make sure that you uh, have a way of monitoring their performance, making sure that they're producing the correct amount of work, that their work is thoroughly done, that deadlines are met, um, that any, any requirements that are, are, are needed to complete a project are, are taken care of. So, um, you know, let's say you have to 
do something that requires a collaborative effort. Well, you want to make sure that those employees are, you know, doing Zoom calls or whatever, getting together so that they can uh, work together on a project, um, despite the fact that they're out of the office. So, you know, you want to make sure that the employee is able to navigate those types of things so that they're able to uh, get their work done and work together. Um, uh, you want to make sure the employee is available to respond promptly to any uh, business inquiries and needs. So, um, you know, make sure that the employee understands um, that, you know, when there's, uh, when you call or when you send them an email, that uh, a response should be given uh, right away or in an appropriate amount of time so that that person can get their work done and that you know everything can work smoothly in the workplace. Uh, next slide. Okay, with respect to a home office, this gets into more of the physical requirements of, of people being able to work at home. I mean, it's you know, it's a challenge, I think, for many of us when, you know, you, you um, transition from work to home, you have different files and, you know, you have things that need to be um, taken care of, handled confidentially, um, and you want to have a, a work area that's set up so that you can function properly when you're uh, remote. So basically having adequate space, um, adequate lighting, uh, phone service, power, internet, all of those types of things. You want to make sure that that space to the extent possible, I mean, it's not always um, ideal, but you wanna make sure that, that you have a little space that's a little separate from, from your living quarters, your main living quarters. So it's not like, you know, you have traffic walking through your, <laughs> your room while you're uh, uh, doing work. I mean, it, 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 again, it's, it's not, going to be the same for everybody, but you just want to have a dedicated space where you know your work um, materials will be, that you're able to access things, and that you're going to be able to keep them separate from uh, other things in your home. So you want to uh, hopefully avoid any intrusions or things that could um, uh, affect your ability to be productive. Um, you know, you, you want to make sure that you have um, a, a desk, a chair, um, that's set up so that you could work just as you would be in the office. Now, with respect to reasonable accommodations, um, it, it, it's, it's important to kind of consider the fact that, um, you know, with respect to uh, disability, um, those types of things may require some accommodations. Um, working from home is basically under the ADA always was something that would be considered as an accommodation for certain people um, uh, in and of itself. So, you know, it, it is something that is part of the interactive process uh, is to be considered with respect to a worker's ability to perform their essential job functions. If essential job functions require customer interaction in an office setting, then working at home isn't going to work. You know, it's not for every type of job. For certain types of jobs, it may, it may work. Uh, for many, if, if not most jobs, it will, it will work. But for some types of jobs, it won't. So working at home, you know, may not be an accommodation that um, is necessary for every particular job. It just depends on the nature of the job. Uh, next slide. Okay. Now, reimbursement of expenses is a bit of a tricky one um, because there's a, a sense to which if you're working at home, um, some of your expenses are going to be the, the expenses like for internet and things like that is, you know, expenses you would have anyway. Um, so it's important to note that, you know, federal law does not require reimbursement for expenses that you, you spend, um, you know, for working at home. Um, now, of course, if there's a non-exempt employee um, and they incur some costs to make themselves uh, able to work at home, in other words, buying equipment or anything like that, uh, that, al that allows them to work at home, if those costs bring their um, wage below minimum wage, so if you add in those costs 
and you add in their wages and they don't balance out and basically it, 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 it brings them below minimum wage, uh, then that would be a problem and you would have to reimburse them under federal law. Now, it's a, a gray area under Maryland state law because uh, the, while there's no court decisions on it that we've seen, the wage claim form under the Department of Labor Licensing and Regulation that somebody would submit if for some reason they weren't, if, if you're claiming that you were not paid certain wages, there's a section of that form for unreimbursed business expenses as a category of unpaid wages. Again, I haven't seen any decisions on it yet, but it appears that people are able to claim that, hey, part of my wage is, um, uh, is, is something that um, would, uh, the fact that I was not compensated for uh, money that I spent in order to be able to work at home um, is, a, um, is a category of wages that I'm claiming uh, in my wage claim as, as something that I'm owed. So basically, you want to make sure that you uh, and communicate employees what your reimbursement policies are, communicate with them to determine whether there are any claimed um, reimbursable expenses, and, and follow up with reminders because you want to you don't want to be surprised. You want employees to take action if they feel like they they uh, incurred an expense that they haven't been reimbursed for. So. If, if an expense is uh, reasonably and, and, and directly connected to the business of the employer um, and the employee incurs that expense, then that is something that um, uh, would probably need to be reimbursed. Um, you don't have to require, you're not required to reimburse an employee uh, for their full cell phone, phone bill if the employee uses a cell phone for both business and personal matters, which most of us do. So, you know, the employees, um, you know, let's say you have unlimited data, unlimited calling, all those types of things, and you have that in, as part of your personal plan, it's not like the employer has to pay for that just because you're using it, your, your cell phone for work as well. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's an expense that you would have normally. So next slide. All right, file access and security. Uh, this is an important thing, especially for those um, employees who are dealing with financial records, customer uh, information, all those types of things. You have to make sure that employees understand their obligation to keep things uh, confidential, just as they would uh, if they were in the office. So you want to be able to make clear to the employees that you uh, are, have the right to monitor uh, their use uh, and their activities on company hardware and software and that you want to make sure that employees know uh, that they keep their files up to date and, 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 and that those files are um, kept confidential in a separate place and uh, can be retrieved by coworkers if needed. So, um, you know, and it's employees' responsibility, whether they're at home or in the office, to safeguard uh, the information that they have uh, that relates to the business um, and make sure that that, uh, that information is able to be accessed um, by coworkers, but that it's not something that's just sitting around generally um, that anybody can access. Okay, next slide. Yeah. All right. So with respect to wage and hour issues with remote work, um, one of the most common things that we see um, is off the clock work claims. You know, when you're in the office, especially if you're, if you're an hourly worker, if you're a non-exempt employee, you're in the office or in, in the facility, you're punching a time clock, we can see the hours that you work and you, know, you, you, you put in your, your time and you get paid for uh, by the hour and, and um, you know, your paycheck accurately should reflect all hours worked during the work, uh, work week when you're punching in a time clock. But what about if you do some work when you're at home and again, not a salaried worker who would get paid anyway, but an hourly worker, um, you know, how are you gonna keep track of that time? So next slide. So 
this has been an issue during COVID because of the surge in telecommuting. So you wanna make sure that you um, make sure all of your employees, not only your exempt employees, but your non-exempt employees are, um, are keeping track of their time. So basically there are gonna be some requirements and, and DOL has, has, um, has posted those in a, um, in a field bulletin uh, as, to, as far as legal standards are applicable to the requirement to track and pay for employees hours work. So next slide. Uh, basically, the consideration is whether an employee has uh, employer has actual or constructive knowledge of additional unscheduled hours worked by employees and whether through reasonable diligence, the employer should have acquired knowledge of such hours. So basically, what, is that, what does that mean? Well, according to the DOL, here's what they said. Uh, one way an employer generally may satisfy its obligation to exercise reasonable diligence to acquire knowledge regarding employees' unscheduled hours of work is by establishing a reasonable process for an employee to report uncompensated work time. We call this a safe harbor provision, and we recommend that all employers have this as part of their employee handbook. And basically what we would want employers to, to basically say in such a policy is that no one is authorized to tell you to work off the clock outside of work hours. So no uh, supervisor can say, hey, you know, you know, we need you to finish this project, but you know, we're, we're really low on overtime funds. I can't, I can't offer um, you overtime. In fact, you really should have finished this earlier. So you know, you're just going to have to stay and finish it. Um, but you're not going to be able to record the hours. Um, you just can't do that. Um, the employee has to know that it, every hour that they work, whether they were inefficient uh, or, or not, has to be reported. It doesn't mean that you can't discipline an employee for inefficiency if they were, you know, not doing all that they needed to do while they were during their regular working hours. But if it takes them longer, they, they have to be able to record that time and they have to be compensated for that time. And if it's over 40 hours, um, it's going to be overtime. And, you know, you have to um, pay the employee for it. Although, again, you can still discipline them for their lack of productivity um, that caused them to have to work overtime. Um, next slide. So if an employee fails to report unscheduled hours work through the procedure established by an employer, the DOL states that the employer generally is not required to investigate further to, un to uncover unreported hours. So if you have this safe harbor provision and you say that if you were ever asked to work off the clock or if you find a discrepancy in your paycheck in terms of the hours that you work and the hours that you paid, you know, report it through this mechanism. Go to HR, call this number, you know, this is what you know needs to happen. So you don't have to go to your supervisor, but there's a, a, a place where you can go to get these things uh, dealt with. Um, you know, normally having HR as being the, the, the people who are dedicated to, um, to resolve these types of things. If you have that in place and you make sure that you've publicized that to employees, if no employee comes and says that they were being asked to work off the clock or that they're um, timesheets were not accurate reflections of the hours work, then you don't have to investigate further. Basically, um, the DOL said, uh, though an employer may have access to non-payroll records of employees' activities, such as records showing employees accessing work issued electronic devices outside of reported hours, reasonable diligence generally does not require the employer to, to undertake impractical efforts, such as sorting through all this information to determine whether its employees worked hours beyond what they reported. So in other words, you just don't have to move heaven and earth to try and figure out, I wonder if anybody worked any uh, unreported hours this week. No, if nobody reports it through the mechanism that you have set up for them to um, uh, to report any off the clock hours that they work, you don't have to go and, and, and look under every rock to find some evidence to see if anybody's working 
more than what they they recorded on their timesheets. Um, you can trust the timesheets and the fact that if somebody is not working or, or is working more than what they record on their timesheets, that they'll bring it forward through the procedure that you've had you have. So it, that's why it's so important to have these safe harbor provisions in an employee handbook um, and, and have it publicized to employees so that they know that they cannot um, uh, that non-exempt employees are not uh, allowed to work off the clock, that they have to record all of their hours and all their time, whether it's where, wherever they may be, whether they're in, in the office, out of the office, in the plant, out of the plant, traveling, whatever. You have to record all your time work and, um, and you have to get paid for all those hours. Next slide. So what are some practical tips? So basically, um, you know, employers should basically rely on, upon normal work, work schedules to establish hours work, uh, but set up this, um, uh, this process, this safe harbor for employees to report any unscheduled hours at their work. Um, and, and it's also important to tell employees to obtain supervisor approval before working overtime. Um, and that's just to make sure that you keep track of the cost and you are aware of, you know, what an employee is going to be doing and what they need to do so that there are no surprises, you know, when somebody's worked overtime, you didn't anticipate it and they had no idea it was happening. So employees must be trained on the process. You want to make sure that they know what they need to do to report the hours that they're uh, working if they're actually working more than what uh, they put on their timesheet. Um, employees mustn't be discouraged from using this process. Um, so you don't want uh, employees to feel like, well, you know, I'm snitching on my supervisor if I report this, so I'm not going to do anything. Um, of course, you can't. Um, you can't help what an employee thinks, but you want to make sure that it is communicated clearly that it is un, um, it, it's just simply not uh, acceptable to not record all the hours that you work. And if for some reason your hours do not accurately reflect what you work, that you report it immediately. Next slide. Okay. Now, for employers who have non-exempt employees who might be doing some type of computer-based work, and this is an important caveat for, for you, um, there are cases, uh, there's at least one case that I have cited here, where um, time spent booting up a, a computer um, and launching software before the actual work begins, um, is, is, was actually considered compensable time. So let's say, you know, you have employees working from home, doing some sort of call center work, um, troubleshooting, um, you know, maybe some IT work, um, and they're working on an hourly basis. The time they spend booting up their computer to, to start working uh, is considered compensable time. So you have to track the time from the time they start booting up uh, to the time they finish. So uh, that's what this Peterson case, which is from the, the 10th Circuit, which doesn't include Maryland, but it's still a, a important guidance because it does interpret federal law, uh, that that's something that you have to consider is that, you know, are, am I paying these employees for all the time that they're working, which would include the time spent booting up their computer. And in this particular case, the, the while it was only um, you know, a few minutes a day that they were doing it, um, it was actually something that added up over time to, a, you know, significant amount. So you want to make sure that that all that time is being tracked. Next slide. All right. So the, there's something that we're, we're calling the great resignation. There's a whole lot of in, in the workplace now, there's a lot of movement. People are moving from one job to another since the pandemic. And basically, you know, there's, there's a really, there's a sense that people have, have gotten that, you know, quality of life issues have become a lot more important. Um, uh, work flexibility, um, the ability to work from home, 
all of those types of things, the pandemic really has changed the workplace, uh, I think, really forever. I mean, this is just something that we have to deal with as employers. Um, and as you consider, you know, hiring people and retaining them, um, keeping them happy, um, it's just important to, to look at all of the factors that um, encompass an employee's work satisfaction. So, you know, it's not just salary, salary is one thing, um, but also, you know, their, their quality of life, their flexibility, all of those types of things with the hybrid workplace, that's something that employees really expect now. And I think that will be um, when you're recruiting people and you're looking at jobs and, and when people are, are making choices about different jobs, that's just something that they're going to consider. So what do you do to protect yourself when people do decide to leave? If they say that, you know, they just want to go someplace else for whatever reason, <coughs> you want to make sure that you protect any uh, confidential information, trade secrets, things of that nature um, when employees leave. Um, you can have what we call restrictive covenant agreements, basically um, that have some limited, um, you can always have confidentiality agreements that protect the data, um, the information that the employee receives during their employment. That's something that's very common and that lasts even after they're no longer employed. So, you know, people sign a confidentiality agreement at the beginning of their employment, the obligations of that confidentiality uh, agreement last um, beyond their period of employment, they're still required to protect the company's confidential information. So you want to remind employees of any type of restrictive covenants um, that go not only confidentiality, but there may be some restrictive covenants that you have that limit their ability to do certain jobs within a certain radius of, of within a certain area. Um, and you know, for a particular time period. Um, and those, are, those have to be very narrowly tailored because um, uh, courts in, have become increasingly uh, skeptical of, um, of uh, restrictive covenant agreements and legislatures have also sort of chipped away at them and chipped away at the abilities uh, of an employer to impose those types of things because basically we want to encourage a free economy where people can go and, and use their talents uh, wherever they would like um, and, and have the freedom to do so uh, without being restricted uh, by employers' restrictive covenants. That's sort of the public policy aspect of this. But nonetheless, you want to be vigilant and you want to make sure that people understand that they have a responsibility to protect the confidential, uh, uh, confidential information, you want to make sure that you know how to get into their computer passwords uh, that are needed to access information. Um, you want to change passwords. You want to obtain all of their keys, all those types of things that you need to do to make sure that employees um, confidential information, any confidential information they received is um, is protected. Next slide. There's something called a common law duty of loyalty. Employees can uh, prepare to compete during their employment, meaning that they can make um, decision, make the decision that I don't want to continue to work here. I want to do the same type of work, but I don't, I don't want to work here anymore. That's fine. Um, but while they're employed, they cannot either compete or solicit customers, usurp business opportunities, misappropriate confidential. Uh, information or conspire to bring about mass resignation. Basically, and this is a, something that we see and, and, and you know, we get frantic uh, calls from employers when this happens is that, you know, an employee is going to leave and they're going to take the whole staff of this, the marketing department with them. Okay. That's something that is, you know, that is, would violate the duty of, of loyalty in, in terms of saying, hey, you know, let's all go elsewhere. Um, you know, the employee basically um, can't, um, while they're employed, uh, make plans to, you know, take a whole department with them, do things that are, are designed to help them start their own business, divert customers away and say, hey, you know what, you know, rather than uh, sign this contract with the employer X, 
um, you know, I'm going to be starting my own company and I'm going to charge only half of this. So you might want to wait and, and uh, sign up with me. No, those types of things would violate the common law duty of loyalty. Those are illegal. Employees can't do those types of, of blatant activities to uh, try and recruit people away or recruit customers or employees away from their employer to go join them someplace else. Um, uh, it's good to have a, 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 an, a a restrictive covenant agreement that that uh, prohibits that makes sure that employees understand that they can't do that um, besides just a common law duty of loyalty but um, that is something that um, uh, is obviously problematic if an employee does try to do that and an employer wants to make sure that they protect themselves from that activity by a, a, a departing employee uh, next slide so you got to be reasonable in terms of if you do have a restrictive covenant agreement, they must be reasonable in scope. Um, and that's going to vary depending on the type of business you are. We can't give you a, a one size fits all and say, you know, one year non competing in this particular area um, in, 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 you know, in Howard County or in Montgomery County is, is would be sufficient. It depends on the type of business. It depends on what the actual employee is is doing um, to see what you could restrict them from doing for a certain time period after their employment. It's it's all going to be fact specific, and there are no general guidelines we can give that would tell you what it is. It's just something that you want to uh, consult with counsel about. So you want to make sure that they understand. You know, adequate consideration is just basically means there's a benefit to the bargain. There's you know each each person gets what they want. You know, you understand that. Um, you know, you give something to get something and basically in return for employing an employee, I mean, employment itself could be adequate consideration um, for someone signing a re restrictive covenant. Um, the fact that they get to um, work for you means that they also agree that if they ever leave you, that they're not going to compete for you know, six months and doing the same thing, that kind of thing uh, within a certain area. Um, you don't want to uh, impose an undue hardship on an employee. Employees got to make a living. You know, if they want to leave, they can go someplace else, but they got to be able to make a living. Um, you know, you don't want to say you, know, you can't do anything in this particular um, field at all. You know, if, if it's going to be something a little different from what they did for you, you know, you want to make sure that you don't have a broad a restrictive covenant that doesn't allow them to, to make a living. So, um, uh, Courts sometimes do what we call uh, blue penciling, meaning that they'll take a uh, restrictive covenant that agreement if they think, ah, it's too broad. We're not going to strike the whole thing down. We're going to limit it to this. So they'll go in and, and the court will say, you know, employer, you, you overreached here, but um, here's a reasonable restriction and we're going to impose this restriction. So it just, you know, if you have to have a the, your agreement scrutinized and blue penciled by the court, it just, you know, it takes a lot to get there in terms of, you know, attorney's fees and all those things you got to consider when you um, have to litigate over a restrictive covenant. Uh, next slide. There is a, a, a law in Maryland called the Maryland Non-Compete and Conflict of Interest Clause Act. It voids any non-compete or conflict of interest clauses for employees who earn an amount equal or less than 31,200 a year, basically saying you can't have a restrictive covenant for somebody who's a low wage earner. Um, people who have uh, a salary of under $31,200 or $15 an hour just simply can't be uh, restricted from competing. Um, so restrictive covenants basically have to be reasonably necessary to protect an employer's business. <coughs> I'm sorry, and the protectable interest for an employer include any confidentiality, uh, any confidential trade secret information, commercial information, those types of things that's dependent upon the employee's special or special or extraordinary services, meaning that anything that an employee does that's um, particular to this company that um, uh, uses confidential information of the company uh, that, they, that the company wants to protect. Um, and should be able to protect. Um, that would be a protectable interest. So um, I think we are 
right at the end here. Um, I uh, uh, thank you all for listening. If you have any other questions, you can either, um, if I, I don't see any in, in the chat, but you know, you can always uh, email me. I've got my email address right there. If you have any further questions and you want to discuss any of these things further, I'd be happy to talk about them with you. Uh, but I've enjoyed being able to present this to you today as part of the BBB series. Um, and I guess this one closes out the series.